And now on the line is Kevin Murphy from North Shore Africa. Uh, welcome to Near FM, Kevin. Thanks for being there. Okay, Kevin, today is my fourth interview with your organisation. I last interviewed Owen O'Nocton around two years ago, and a long time ago I interviewed Colm Ash and one of your volunteers, Dervila Daly. The interviews with Owen and Dervila or Oskwaga. Uh, as it has been a long time since I did an Osperla interview with your organisation, Kevin, could you remind our listeners today on Near FM about, a bit about who North Africa are and the brilliant work that you just do? Hi, certainly. Well, Darren, thanks, William. Yeah, so North Africa is an Irish-funded organisation. Um, we work in Uganda and we provide access to healthcare, education, economic empowerment through microfinance, that's income generation, um, nutrition projects, and then we work in trial protection. We also work in one UN refugee camp in northern Uganda for people fleeing war in South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So in Uganda, they have an open border policy in terms of refugees. So there's one and a half million refugees in the country. Um, I think Uganda is now the third or fourth highest refugee hosting country in the world. Um, and we provide uh, all of the above, but we have a pretty comprehensive child protection program focused on unaccompanied children who are arriving into the camp. And you have a, a centre in Uganda, don't you? We do, yeah. So here in Ireland, current, so myself and the CEO, Brian Ardell, Brian's from Donamid, um, we are the only Irish staff. And um, Brian spends a lot of his time overseas. Um, so that leaves me holding up the fort here. And then in Uganda, we have about 108 staff and they're all, all Ugandan serving their community. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and uh, it's a big centre you have. Am I, am I right in saying that it's uh, an or- orphanage? No, we certainly don't. Um, that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah or- or- orphanages are... That's the reason I got in touch with you. Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, that's the main reason I got in touch with you to do this interview today, Kevin, is that I saw yeah. on social media yesterday that on Wednesday the 25th that yourselves and another couple of organisations made a presentation at Aractus Aaron about orphanages. Uh, this is a big question, Kevin, but let's come back to what we're saying there. But, but can you fill our listeners in, for those who don't know, about what your day on Wednesday was all about? Yeah, so uh, actually for the last six years, um, a number of organisations under the umbrella of um, of Kolov, and Kolov is the um, organisation which um, essentially supports uh, the best practice and volunteer standards for overseas sending agencies. So for six years, we've been working very much on this uh topic of orphanage volunteering and alternative methods of, methods of care for children. So um, on Wednesday, we were invited into the AV room in Dáil Éireann to, to present to uh, TD senators and ministers uh, with regards to um, this campaign. So we're very much focused on trying to shift the practice of orphanage volunteering um, and, and to end the practice from Ireland. And then also um to support community-based and family-based care within the community as an alternative to orphanages and the reality is research has shown that there's an estimated 5.4 million children who live in orphanages worldwide and a over 80 percent of these children have at least one living parent so although they are in orphanages they are absolutely not orphans so um And then the biggest driver of these children into these institutions is poverty and a lack of access to services like health, like education and for for children with disabilities, um, you know, their service is not available within these countries. So essentially a child with a disability in in a country for, let's say, you know, I'll use Uganda because it's the country that we work primarily in. um, a, a, A child with a disability in Uganda is 17 times more likely to end up in an orphanage than his or her peer. Okay, am I right? Are you calling for the closing of all orphanages? Like, oh, what's the story? Yeah, so certainly not the closure, but it's it's very much, and this isn't just us. So, um, in twenty uh, December twenty nineteen, um, the UN General Assembly, um, there was a resolution on the rights of the child, which was formally adopted, and Ireland was one of the countries that adopted to it. 
it's up to this, committed to strengthening children's care in families and preventing the unnecessary separation um, of children from families. And then understanding what the root causes of this are, you know, so um, the, there's within this resolution, there's a commitment to end, progressively end child institutionalization and replace it with family and community based care. So it's very much focused on this isn't, you know, we're, we're shutting down orphanages today. This is a process about reintegrating children into their communities and families and services are required for that to happen. And like, again, uh, using Nurture Africa as uh, an example, you know, the, the, the services and programs that we have in place in terms of healthcare, in terms of access to education, in terms of psychosocial support, you know, we have a, a pediatric rehabilitation program. These types of projects are what support families to keep their children within homes instead of looking towards an institution because families can't, they have no way of caring for children or providing an education. Um, so that's where our focus is very much on in line with this resolution that it's it's very progressive. There are countries like this, again, it, it's not something that, that you know, we've come up with over the last six years. There are countries in Europe and the global south that have um, made great strides in this. Like in, in Rwanda um, over the past 10 years, they have progressively um, reintegrated 95% of children who were living within orphanages back into their families. 95%, that's an incredible number. Countries like Moldova, Bulgaria here in Europe are doing the same. Last year, the Kenyan government um, launched a new strategy, which is very much whole countrywide towards um, reintegrating children back into their families. So it, it is something that is being driven by the countries in the global south, in Africa, in Asia, um, and that's it, it. Is it is not about closing an orphanage tomorrow, and then you know these children scatter. It, there's a process of um, you know across obviously a lot of allied health uh, you know services as well in terms of counselling, in terms of disability, um, social work, uh, finding these children's families, and then over an extended period of time reintroducing these children back into their families, into their communities, whilst supporting the family with the necessary requirements to ensure that fam the family unit stays together. Um, so it is very much about redirecting resources during that time from orphanages back towards community-based care. Again, the research has shown orphanages are you know, up to 10 times more costly than the provision of family and community-based care. So the... the um, the answer in inverted commas uh, that, that orphanages provide is more costly. It's more detrimental towards child's health, uh, any child's health. Um, and these are the reasons that, again, the research has shown, um, you know, that orphanage care is harmful to children. Mm -hmm. It results in significant delays in physical, emotional development, brain development, and it exposes children to neglect and abuse. Okay, and can you, I don't know if you can do this, but can, can you tell me like some of the organisations or groups in Ireland who, who do, who have orphanages or, or work abroad in, with orphanages to send people abroad, do you know? I, yeah, I do, and I'm not going to mention them, um, because it's certainly not, I don't, I don't want to mention some and not others, but like we can think about um, in terms of, like one of our recommendations in terms of, so we had four recommendations that we brought to Dáil Éireann on Wednesday. Number one was that Irish Aid should, should introduce a dedicated funding stream for care reform strategies, and that includes family and community-based support programmes. Uh, the second was that the Department of Foreign Affairs should be introducing foreign travel advice, warning against the harm of orphanage volunteering. There are, like the UK, the US and Australia already have this in place in terms of warning their citizens against volunteering in orphanages and then outlining what the dangers are. Um, like people who volunteer in orphanages go with the best of intentions. I, you know, we absolutely appreciate that, but it's really about educate, educating ourselves now in terms of, you know, is this right? Like when we consider um, where we are sending our people, like if, you know, let's say there would be a lot of transition year school programs and um, within these programs, students would go to Africa or Asia 
and volunteer in an orphanage or go on a school trip to an orphanage. Um, when when we really consider with like if these 15, 16, 17, 17 year olds here in Ireland would would we ever consider allowing them to have access to the most vulnerable children within Irish society? Of course we wouldn't. Mm. So why is it acceptable that we can allow this to happen in, in another country? So again, with the, like another recommendation, you know, recommendation four of, of our ask, you know, with the Department of Education, Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth is to develop child safe guidelines for overseas trips. And that includes guidance from the department to schools, not to visit or volunteer in orphanages. Yeah, I remember several years ago reading an article about, quote, volunteerism, volunteerism, although I don't recall from what newspaper organisation the article was on. I found the article to be very eye-opening, though I haven't heard much about the issue since then. Um, yeah. am, am I right in saying that, like, the whole issue of volunteerism, and I know people who go, teenagers who go abroad mightn't see themselves as being tourists, but the issue of it in general is a lot more serious when it comes to orphanage, orphanages than it is in other areas? Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, because you have essentially unvetted, un, you know, restricted access to children. Um, and again, the most vulnerable children in the society, when you think, um, like from my own perspective, within my role in Nurture Africa, so um, when I became, so Nurture Africa has a volunteer program, we very much focus on ethical volunteering that is skills based um, we again 10 years ago we did volunteer in orphanages we changed our practice as a result of you know what we were seeing um, and I, I, so I'm a trained psychological debriefer um, so when volunteers come home we, we will always have a psychological debrief and that's really to ensure that you know probably a, a, in and around a month after volunteers come back that we meet as a group and, you know, we discuss the challenges, et cetera, of the overseas placement and anything essentially that's followed them home. And the goal of it is really to ensure that when, when a volunteer comes back from an overseas experience, that that experience is being processed in a positive manner and is enabled. So they're enabled essentially to move on with life, having had this experience. And obviously, as part of our duty of care, it's really important in terms of psychological well-being that no volunteer comes home um, and has been traumatized as a result of any aspect of the experience and can't move on with life because, you know, this trauma is essentially front and center. So they can't really um, get about there, you know, back into work, back into college, whatever it may be. So um, that is incredibly important in terms of that well-being. And... Um, that duty of care is so important when, so 10 years ago when we were operating in orphanages, you know, when I was conducting a psychological debrief, this is all I was dealing with. Uh, um, people, people were coming home with serious, we had volunteers, like countless volunteers that were going for counselling uh, after psychological debrief as a result. And then, and that's the volunteer. These are all your citizens. Then we have Children, again, in our instance, I'll use Uganda, but this is happening all over Sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia, where you have extremely vulnerable children. They're welcoming somebody, you know, into their life, essentially, for one, two, three weeks, and then strike up a bit of a bond, they're gone. Uh. Somebody else comes a week later, another. So, obviously, you know, the offset of that is an attachment disorder. So, mm -hmm. children essentially become totally detached because, essentially, uh, you know, all these interactions are brief, so they open themselves up. You know, obviously, again, volunteers come, the best of intentions. They're showering these children with love, gone, one after the other. And then it just becomes a vicious circle. And, you know, for these children, yeah, that's where those detachment disorders um, start to emanate from. And these children, that's, you know, socially. And we have to keep in mind that for a lot of these children in institutions, once they're 18, they're kicked out the door mm. yeah. and no social support. They've no, like they, they've no comprehension of the world that they're, they're stepping into. Um, and that's, again, the research has shown that for a lot of these people, unfortunately, you know, 
a life of um you know the 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 chances of incarceration you know for for females moving into prostitution um their suicide unfortunately they're all you know multiplied in by the hundreds mm -hmm. as a result of their childhood spent in an orphanage yeah, you mentioned there like the kind of vicious cycle of um people going from Ireland for a couple of weeks but I think even if the volunteer from Ireland goes for a year it's still in some ways it could be worse like in, in as regards yeah. as regards relationships because a year for a child like, like children live for about 18 years old so like uh yeah it's a huge issue um i won't keep much longer kevin and um, like uh, i i know the process is kind of started already going back to 2019 in the u.n i think you said but um like yeah. is it realistic to expect that over the short to medium term like that that, that the whole system of orphanages is going to end and we're going to have proper community kind of services like i'd say yeah it's kind of like this this will like we could be looking at a generation here you know but it's about taking those steps so the like the last thing you know we want to see is this done poorly or you know in a hurried manner it's not about like we're not advocating for you know anything being closed tomorrow or next year next month next year this is about within communities so where these orphanages exist you know you you could be looking at before a child leaves an orphanage, you could be looking at a year or two years work, you know, before a child, before a family and a community is ready to accept the child back. Um, so it is, it's, it's a process. Um, and like, it's, it's nothing new. It's not, we're not reinventing the wheel. This is happening. It's, as I said, it's happening in Europe. It's happening in countries in Africa, like some of, even the statistics in terms of Cambodia, like a frightening, you know, from let's say 2005 to 2015, Cambodia saw a 75% increase in the number of orphanages within the country. Mm. Yes, there was no underlying cause. Mm. No war, you know, no conflict, no um, weather event, nothing. Um, so, in you know they within Cambodia they look at it very much as um, it's it's essentially it's for profit um, that they're you know they go you know within these institutions they are private they seek funding um, like again we had a testimony within um, on Wednesday from Stephen Usembe um, from Home for Homes in Kenya and Stephen is a care lever himself who now works in this process of care reform um so like from from his perspective uh stephen stephen brought like he was the main speaker obviously on the day but like it, it's coming from a care lever who shared his story of care what it meant to him you know the, the other children who were within um the institution that he lived for 15 years of his childhood and then what it means to him now like for unfortunately you know, one of the very few success stories where, you know, he would speak about other children who um, who were who were in the, the mm. institution with him, who, who, who went on a very different path, you know. But for Stephen, he was fortunate enough um, and he could. Yeah, it's 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 his work now ending ending this practice, you know, yeah. and getting families back or getting families re reunited and children back into the community. Yeah, you know, I was reading about him on social media yesterday. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, do you believe like that there that there will always be a space for adoption, including people from the west, the the global north, like Europe, adopting people, uh, children from like say Africa, developing countries. Yeah, I think there always will be a space, but again, it has to be done right. You know, um, I think like we've heard some horror stories in terms of adoption as well and just the process is not being being carried out as they should have been from a, a government level um and that's from within institutions again private institutions you know we were again probably 2018 i think just before COVID, 2018 2019 there was a story in uganda of um children being adopted from uganda to the united states um but they had family in uganda so the child was unaware that they had family in Uganda. The family in the States were unaware that there was family in Uganda. 
um, and mm-hmm. the family in Uganda were under were unaware that their child had been adopted out of the country. Cool. Um, so, like, really, that's the sort of stuff that sends the shiver down the spine, you know. So, um, I done right. There is always there is always a case for it. Like again, when we speak about you know orphanages and institutions, there was no such thing as an orphanage or an institution before colonialism. Hmm. So, like. Europe, Europeans brought institutionalization to sub-Saharan Africa, let's say. Um, so again, I use Uganda as an example. So there would be a large focus on, on kinship care. So, you know, if one or two bear, parents, um, you know, pass away, that, you know, those children, the extended family then looks, you know, to, at the children and, okay, who can take these children in? So there would be a large focus. And again, that, that, that would be one of the alternative care methods that we would be very much focused upon um, because that is something very cultural in Uganda in terms of, you know, um, taking care of extended families' children if there's a requirement to do so. Okay, Kevin, can you tell me if you are optimistic that with the work that yourselves in North Africa Call of Volunteer Fund are doing this week to raise awareness of volunteering, can you tell me if you're optimistic that in an Irish context what you are highlighting will end in this country in the not too distant future? Yeah, that's that's down to well, we we pitched to the we made our pitch to the politicians, you know, so um, we were clear that this requires leadership. Um, from government, uh, and that's that's the, you know we're moving to the next chapter certainly now obviously in terms of of our work and that's where it will lie for us you know in terms of those government departments and and really working with them to ensure that you know these recommendations can be um, like in terms of the asks it you know and and our work it's not a lot so like for the Department of Foreign Affairs to introduce travel advice warning. There's not a, that's not the biggest of asks. Again, with the Department of Education, Children, Equality, Disability, Integration, Youth, um, should we be sending, you know, transition year students to an institution? When we, you know, critically think about it, these are things that shouldn't, we wouldn't accept it here. So, like, the rights of a child are universal. Um, so if we're not going to accept it here, how is it acceptable that we're facilitating it in another country? So again, it's not a big ask. Um, and then the other pieces around those dedicated funding streams, and then for Irish Aid, just to recognise the harm of orphanage volunteering, um, and ensure that you know if you know there's an organisation that's applying for funding that is that is linked towards orphanages or orphanage volunteering, that Irish Aid will will decide that 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 won't that uh, application will um, you know essentially be refused. Uh, at once and um, so our asks certainly aren't going to change the world but it's it's very much this is as i said it is we're not leading this this is being led by countries in africa in asia and all we're asking is that the irish government will show leadership from the global north from our part of the world in terms of you know our responsibilities uh towards because like one of the mantras of irish aid is in terms of you know kind of um the you know the the last becomes the first essentially you know so the most vulnerable are are the most important and in this instance obviously for for children living in orphanages these are extremely vulnerable children um and we want to ensure that their rights are upheld yeah if the practice of irish volunteers going to vol- going to work on orphanages abroad totally ended uh, I think yeah. a huge uh, progress and I know you just mentioned them but like the, the Department of Education is very important in that regard aren't they? Most certainly yeah like because again I've, I've heard countless stories um, you know from from because within our volunteer program as I said like we, we have a, a skills based volunteer program so a lot like we'd have volunteers who would travel to Uganda with a healthcare background you know from uh from a teaching background we have several corporate partners um and you know we have yeah i get it every year even this year with applications for our program where people saying you know i I, you know in school i went to um you know country x i will say uh to volunteer in an orphanage you know i was 16 years of age um in one instance um uh, in a in a recent uh, application, 
So we would have an interview process. And during that interview, I was told by an individual that, um, and this again sends a shiver down my spine, that the school had a raffle to decide which students got to volunteer in the orphanage. Mm. That's that's frightening okay. stuff. Um, so, like, the, I yeah, in terms of that, upholding the rights of the child, which you know, we would we would certainly hope that you know, in 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 this instance, the Department of Education would t- would take a, a really strong look at this. You know, like, and again, in terms of endorsers for this program, like, we we have we've we we have a number of endorsers, and the INTO is actually one. Um, UNICEF Ireland, we have, uh, like, there's within the campaign that list, that growing list of endorsers of of unions and entities within Ireland and within the broader uh, charity sector or the NGO network who are, um, you know, putting their shoulder to the wheel here in terms of, of supporting the work. Um, is That's really encouraging for us as well, you know, because, like, every week, you know, Within our work, we're hearing, you know, the INTO are on board, the INMO are on board, um, and that's really, really important to us as well, as I say, because um, it's something, obviously, you know, having spoken with them, you know, it's something then that they obviously believe in and, and see the need to change. So that's um, that's always encouraging, and it gives us certainly the encouragement to, to continue. As I said, um, I read an article several years ago about the term voluntourism. Is the yeah. term voluntourism actually a common word in places like, say, the continent of Africa? Like, is, is, is that how all this kind of work in the orphanage is by volunteers? Is, is, is that how it's kind of looked upon? Or is that just a kind of a occasional war? You know what I mean? Like, oh, what's the story? Yeah, so it wouldn't be something else. So they would view it as, as volunteering. Um, in, in in again in my instance um from my experience in uganda it's always volunteering the volun like again some of the some of the threats probably uh, in terms of volunteerism are you know you can have somebody backpacking in any part of the world um and like again many probably 10, ten years plus uh i was in peru and um there was an opportunity to go and volunteer in a, in an orphanage for a day um and you paid for the privilege um so like w- within w- the hostel at the time that i was staying it was very, like people were like we're going to do this you know so I'm, I'm sitting down trying to educate them on the danger of this you know because again it, on the surface it seems like it, it's 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 well it's well intentioned you know, you're going to interact with these children, but the harm, and then of course, by paying, it's like it's it's just it kind of uh, it really reinforces the model, and it becomes for profit. You know, so the fear always is these children are just you know churned out in the morning. You know, go play with the volunteers, and you know volunteers are coming in every day paying you know ten, the equivalent of you know five, ten, fifteen euros to interact with these children, and you know, what has that money been used for? Where is it going? I met in the article I read several years ago, it was very striking because it was written by a young woman who herself worked in, in a developed country when she was a teenager. And I think she was American, but she said that uh, she, she raised money to go, I forget what country it was, but she raised a couple of thousand dollars or whatever, and she helped build a house or something, or some centre or something, and she said, like, for all the money she raised uh, to go over there, it would have been much better to give the money to a local trader to build the house, like, she didn't know how to build the house, she had to be taught, you know, yeah. but I, 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 yeah. I, 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 I know that's not exactly, exactly the same. It, no, Darren, thanks a million. I uh, really appreciate your support, I must say, over the years. Um, yeah, uh, just want to wish you the best of luck. Look, I think, you know, there there is an endorsement campaign um, as well. So if anybody is interested in uh, in obviously learning more, they can go to the Colob website. So um, that is, so Colob is C-O-M-H. L A M H. So if somebody was to Google essentially Kolov and the word orphanage, 
they will get through and see, um, you know, the research is there, there's media releases, and then if they want to support the campaign, they can do so. And we're also encouraging as many people as possible to contact their local representative, you know, so um, whoever is is representing them either in government or, um, you know, as, as a as a TD or as a deputy to, um, yeah, we're, we're encouraging everybody to get in touch and just uh, raise the issue as well, because um, like we feel certainly there's a bit of a groundswell. Um, again, given given the piece we did on Wednesday, um, like another Emma Lynch from Tier Fund was on um, RTE radio at one o'clock with Brian Dobson speaking about the issue. Um, and there's been several other interviews conducted throughout the island of Ireland over radio. So, um, yeah, just just really, really, really positive to get to get the information out there because, yeah, like it's it's obviously it only becomes um, an issue when when it's known, you know. So for us, it's it's been a it's, it's a really positive week. And I want to thank you for for um, amplifying uh, the message a little bit more. So, um, yeah, so our, within our own volunteer program, so we're recruiting um, currently for our summer program for, um, so that involves a three-week placement overseas in Uganda um, through June, July and August, mainly um, teaching and healthcare volunteers, but at the same, or professionals at the same time, if somebody has um, a bit of a business head on their shoulders as well, very, very welcome. And then we have a two-week placement that takes place in October, and that is very much um, business orientated and, and and skills focused as well. So it's all about um, you know bringing the skills and knowledge that you have to Uganda, and more so working with staff in terms of Skillshare. Um, so there are programs, yeah.